again and welcome back to my kitchen. Happy fall! We are quickly heading into winter in our area of the world and my mind automatically starts turning towards hot comforting meals like beef stew. Um, there are two ways that you can can beef stew at home. If you go ahead and prepare your beef stew the way that you normally do, whether you roast it in the oven or whether you stick it in the crock pot, whatever you do to cook that beef stew, you can go ahead and you can cook it and then you can place it into your canning jars and can it at meat times. That's absolutely an amazing way to do things. Um, but when I am looking ahead and meal prepping, I really love to raw pack my beef stew. That means everything is pretty much raw. And I just stuff it in my jar and it cooks during the canning process. Um, so today I would like to show you how I personally do that at home. Now, I'm going to be using my pressure canning, canner, but I want to let all of you who exclusively hot water bath know, yes, you can do this also. All right, I know there's a lot of people out there that maybe don't have um, the funds to invest in a pressure canner, or maybe they're a little bit intimidated um, by the idea of using a pressure canner. I just don't want you to go away feeling like this doesn't include you, because it does. You can hot water bath this, all right? So come along with me while I show you what it is that I do. One of the things that's amazing about stew is that it is so flexible, all right? You get to put in whatever it is that you like to have in your stew. And this doesn't only go for beef either. You can make venison stew. You can make pork stew. If you want to make a chicken stew, go ahead and do that. It's whatever you have available to you. So today I'm going to be doing beef stew. And generally when I am canning my beef stew, I pretty much just kind of do it off the hip and I throw things into my canning jars. And so I don't necessarily always think about measurements, um, quote unquote. But I did sit down today in preparation um, for making this video and I thought, well, you know what? I better really think about this and I better kind of have some estimations for them so that those who need a recipe or at least a recipe base, you have something to work off of, okay? So I'm just going to go through what I've prepared today, all right? And I am preparing to make seven quarts of beef stew, okay? So hopefully these ingredients will fill seven quarts of beef stew. Um, I've prepared four pounds of raw beef. Now I uh, just took my beef roasts out of the freezer. I fully defrosted them. They're not even uh, really chilled anymore. But I defrosted my, my beef roasts and I cut them into about mm, one inch cubes or so. And this really doesn't have to be exact either. But you can see that this is about the size that I cut mine into. Now, the cut of meat technically <clears throat> does not matter. If you can get a really good deal on beef chuck roast, snag them up. If you can get a really good deal on stew meat, snag it up. If you can get an amazing deal on cheap, uh, like what is it, round steaks, you know, sometimes those are a little bit less expensive snag them up. It all works, okay? And like I said, venison works. Pork works. I know people are finding amazing deals on pork butts right now, pork butt roasts. You can absolutely make a pork stew with those cuts of meat. Um, right now it's deer hunting season, so make a venison stew. The type of meat is completely up to you, and the vegetables that you put into your stew are completely up to you. I'm just going to kind of walk you through what I generally do, all right? So I have four pounds of raw beef that is cubed and just ready to go. I have one very large onion that I have diced up. 
I have two cups of corn. Now, the corn that I'm using was previously frozen corn, all right? And actually, it was store-bought corn because all of the corn that we got from our garden and that I bought from the neighborhood um, vegetable stand, I have already canned all that up. So I had some store-bought frozen corn in the freezer. I just took that out and I defrosted it and that's what I'm using today. And the same with the peas. I have approximately two cups of frozen peas that I have defrosted. And of course, you know, if there's any uh, additional juice or whatever when you defrost these, I drain that off. But frozen vegetables work. Um, even previously canned vegetables. I could have went into my storage and I could have brought out a, a can of previously canned corn and that would have worked fine. It's what you have on hand. So if you have previously canned corn or previously canned peas, you go ahead and you use them. Drain off the juice and just use them. If you have frozen ones, you use those. If you have fresh vegetables, use those. Use what you have on, on hand. I have two cups of carrots. Now I did have fresh carrots on hand and so I scrubbed those up really well and I cut those and when I'm uh, preparing, preparing my raw vegetables, you can see this isn't as big of a piece. My lighting, you guys, every single time I get frustrated. <laughs> but anyway, they're not, they're not very large pieces there. Not very large pieces. Um, now if you wanted to cut those into coins, you could do that. I do tend to cut mine just a little bit smaller simply because then I know I can fit more into my jar. Now when you think about a quart jar, all right, a quart jar, four cups is all this quart jar holds. And so this is going to feed maybe two or three people. If you have huge chunks of vegetables filling this jar, you're going to get what? maybe six pieces of carrot and maybe 10 chunks of potatoes in there along with your meat, right, for your stew. So I tend to, to cut my things a little bit smaller when I am doing stew in a jar, just simply because then I can fit more vegetables into the jar. All right, so we stopped at two cups of carrots. I have approximately seven medium-sized potatoes. I just kind of estimated approximately one potato per jar, and we're trying to fill seven jars here today. I'm going to put salt, pepper, minced garlic, and rosemary in, and those are just to my taste, and I'm going to add parsley also. I guess I forgot that on my list, um, but the herbs and the spices are completely up to you. Now, just because I put it in my jar, doesn't mean that you have to. I know that there are a lot of people that um, really don't care for garlic. Leave it out. If you don't like rosemary, leave it out. If you would like to put in a different type of herb, go ahead and just put in what you want. Um, uh, let's see, I left off on the rosemary. Um, and then we're gonna need some broth. Now, when I am making beef stew, I do tend to use beef broth, but you know what? That's completely flexible also. If you only have chicken broth on hand, you go ahead and use your chicken broth. If you only have vegetable broth on hand, you go ahead and use that. If you don't have either one of those things, you go ahead and you grab your granular, uh, whether you would have beef or chicken or pork, granular broth, and you mix that up with your water, and you use that. Now, if you're going to be using granulated um, broth mixes from the store, please keep in mind that those tend to be very, very salty. So you might then, if you use that, you might want to omit the salt measurement that I'm going to use today. Um, if you want to spice it up and put some green bell peppers in there, you go ahead and do that. If you like to have tomatoes in your stew, you go ahead and you add tomatoes. I'm personally not going to do that today because this is just the stuff that I have on hand that I want to use. Um, right now, potatoes are on an absolutely wonderful sale um, at a local, uh, well, it's kind of like a convenience gas station. Um, I'm getting them for 20 cents a pound, and so 
I have tons of potatoes right now, and so potatoes is going to be one of my main vegetables in there, and the corn and the peas are just kind of, um, of additional goodies that I'm putting in there. Um, if you want to put green beans in it instead of the peas, that's absolutely fine, or if you want to put it in addition to, you guys get the idea. It is so, so flexible. You do you. And uh, this is just going to be canned at meat times, both for the pressure canner or the hot water bath. So for now, I am going to page down so that you can see how I have taken all of these ingredients that I've told you about and the amounts, and I just kind of equally distribute them into my jars. And again, I say, this is all raw pack. So let's get you tilted down here and hopefully, yeah, my light is going to cooperate. So this is wonderful. When this happens and it's not a glare and it's not all bright white, that's wonderful. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually start with my salt and pepper and onion. And the reason why I do this is because they kind of lay nice and flat in the bottom of the jar, okay? So I'm just going to take my half teaspoon measure. Now, if you have regular canning salt or kosher salt, you can go ahead and you can use up to one teaspoon in each jar. I use the, the fine ground pink Himalayan. And I really, really, there's so many more granulars that can fit into a measuring spoon that I really cut it back to half the regular measurement. So kosher salt and canning salt, you go ahead and add one full teaspoon. If you are doing the same as I am with the fine ground pink Himalayan, only use a half a teaspoon. Otherwise, it just gets way too salty. So I go ahead and I add my salt measurement to each jar. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and I'm going to put in one half teaspoon of ground pepper to each jar. Now, like I said, this is all to your own taste. If you don't like pepper or if you have a dietary restriction on salt, you don't have to have either one of those things in there. This is just what I do for my family and my family's preference. And then what I am going to do is I'm going to reach back here and I'm going to add a little bit of rosemary. Now, rosemary is one of those things that uh, can sometimes become a little bit overpowering. And rosemary actually, you know, when you're talking the whole rosemary, it's kind of hard to measure. But... I put in about, and I have the wrong one here, I put in a quarter of a teaspoon of rosemary. That's just one of those things that I prefer not to get too overpowering in my stew. But a little touch of it is really nice. It's a really nice addition. So one quarter of a teaspoon of rosemary. Now, like I said, none of that is necessary. If you don't want those things in your stew, don't put them in there. But this is what I do, okay? And then I take and I put in, if I can find my correct measuring spoon, I'm going to put in a full teaspoon <clears throat> of parsley flakes. Excuse me. All right. Another thing that we personally really, really love in pretty much all of our canning is garlic. Now, I buy minced garlic. You can put fresh garlic in, uh, fresh minced garlic in if you want. But um, because I use it so much and because I'm canning all the time, I just buy these great big uh, minced garlic containers from Sam's Club. And this is what I use. Um, and we love this in pretty much all of our soups and stews. So because we are just kind of garlic freaks, I put in an entire tablespoon of garlic, okay? I know that all of my family members love garlic. 
and so that is not going to be too much for them. You adjust your measurement to your taste. And of course, if you, you know, when you go ahead and you use these and you don't feel like you had enough of a certain herb in your stew, you can always add more uh, when you go to heat and serve, okay? So I will say, that's uh, actually another additional little tip, <coughs> excuse me, is that you can always add more when you heat to serve. You cannot take it out after you've added it. But my family loves garlic, so that's not going to be an issue. Now, I have a large chopped onion, and I'm just going to equally distribute that. And, you know, depending on the size of your onion, uh, it will depend on how much per jar you want to put in. Or... Excuse me, I have something really bothering my throat all of a sudden. Um, or if you don't like onion at all, you don't need to add it. But I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to equally distribute all of this onion into my jars. All right, so I have additional onion left over. I'm just going to go ahead and add a little bit to each jar until I've equally distributed that whole onion. So we pretty much have all of our seasonings in our jars, equally distributed in our jars. And now what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to start adding my vegetables. <clears throat> and I have two cups of corn, so I should be able to get approximately a third cup into each jar. Maybe a scant third cup. And like I said, this was frozen corn. So you just go ahead and use whatever you have. Canned corn is fine. Frozen corn is fine. Um, <clears throat> just if it's canned corn, make sure that you uh, drain off the excess juice. before you put it in your canning jar. All right, so we have a corn in there. And now we are going to go ahead and we are going to do approximately a third cup of peas per canning jar. And I think I defrosted plenty of peas, so I'm gonna put in a full third cup. I had two small packages of peas in the freezer and I just wasn't really sure how they were going to settle in there, so I just defrosted both of them. And if I have leftovers, we're just going to use those for supper tonight. <clears throat> All right, wonderful. That fit in wonderfully. And then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add approximately a third cup of carrots. Now again, here, you can do fresh carrots like I have done or you can do previously frozen carrots, or you can even use previously canned carrots. All right, that's totally up to you. But I'm gonna do approximately one third cup of carrots. Now the reason why I'm being so, um, I guess, conservative on these measurements is we still need to fit potatoes and meat into this jar. Okay, so, and remember that you are probably only getting two or three servings out of each quart jar. So it doesn't have to be jam-packed full of all of these veggies. <clears throat> and you definitely want enough space for your potatoes and your meat to fit in there yet. And potatoes I want to be one of my main ingredients. I think I might just add a few extra carrots to each jar.
All right, so I've equally distributed my two cups of carrots. And now come the potatoes, all right? Now the potatoes I like to, when I'm doing my, my, uh, my beef stew, I like to cube my potatoes. And I generally do peel them, but you do not have to peel them. You do you, okay? They can be unpeeled if you want. These happen to be a little bit, the peels were a little bit on the green side. And they, um, <clears throat> they were a little bit sunburnt. And so I did choose to peel these today. And I just like to cube them a little on the smaller side because, like I said, if you leave them in great big chunks when you're doing a stew, you're only going to get a few little pieces of potato into each jar. And so the smaller you cut them for beef stew, the more you're going to be able to fit into your jar. And I'm just going to go ahead and I'm just going to add a couple little handfuls of potatoes to each jar. And like I said, I think I had about five potatoes today, four or five large potatoes that I prepared. Hopefully I've prepared enough. It looks like I have. I'm feeling pretty confident about it. Like I said, I usually do it off the hip. And if you need more, you can always stop and you can peel and cut more. Okay? I'm just kind of giving you a, a rough estimate of uh, estimated items that you will need for this many jars of stew. And I did put my peeled and fresh cut potatoes into cold water so that they would stay nice and white while I was sitting here and getting my jars loaded. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and maybe distribute a few more potatoes into a couple more jars here leaving enough room for my meat also. Um, ultimately what I like to do is I like to fill my jar approximately half full with my raw vegetables and then that leaves plenty of room for me to still add my meat on top. <clears throat> all right, so I think that's about all the potatoes that I want to add. <laughs> move this around here. Now what you can do is if you can reach your stuff, you can go ahead and you can kind of pack it down with your, with your hands and kind of shake, shake your potatoes and your vegetables and pack them into your jar nice and tight. If you can't reach them, then go ahead and just take like the end of a spoon or something like that and kind of pack them down in there and settle them in. All right. So whatever works for you, you just go ahead and do that. So I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to shake and settle my things in really nice and, and well packed as much as I can. I'll show you this jar up close approximately half full with your veggies okay and you can see how I've kind of compacted my layers you can see my onions down there you know you have your spices on the bottom you have your layer of onions corn peas carrots and potatoes on top and you still have room on top for your meat but at this point in time is when I suggest that you add your broth okay and the reason why I say this is because <clears throat> when you are canning raw meat, raw meat creates its own broth. We will be adding raw meat at the top of this pack, okay? But now think about it. Your raw meat will only create enough juice to cover itself. It doesn't create enough juice to incorporate and cover all of your veggies. So your veggies need broth to cover them. Your meat at the top does not. So this is why I add my broth at this point in time. And what I do with my broth is that I add my broth to a level of one quarter inch less 
than the top of the veggies. All right. So I'm going to add my broth. And hopefully the camera will pick this up. Can you see that level of broth? Let's see. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. But my broth level is right here. My potatoes are still a one quarter of an inch sticking out above the broth level, okay? I'm not going to completely cover those veggies. I'm just bringing that broth level up to one quarter of an inch less than my total amount or the total level of fresh veggies. I hope that makes sense. All right, so I'm going to continue adding my broth to my other jars to one quarter of an inch less than covering my veggies. And of course, you know, the potatoes are at the top. So that's what I'll say. Since my potatoes are at the top, I'll say one quarter of an inch less than covering the potatoes. That might make it a little bit more easy to understand. And <coughs> I'm going to stop the camera because I have family members coming home right now. Okay, so our wonderful son has come home from work and we got to say our, our hellos and the dog has settled back down. So I will continue. Um, I moved uh, some of my filled jars that I already put the broth in. I moved them into this back row. And so I have two more jars to fill with broth here yet. And again, like I said, just fill that broth mark to approximately a quarter of an inch underneath the top of the level of the potatoes because your meat is going to add juice to this jar and it will complete filling it with juice that is rendered as the meat cooks. Alrighty, so let's set this over here and get that out of the way. So let's see if I can get this where you can see it. You can see my broth level is a quarter of an inch underneath the top of my potatoes. It covers all of the vegetables but it's a quarter of an inch shy of covering the potatoes. And now you're going to take your meat, your raw beef or venison or pork or whatever you want to use, and you start placing that equally into your jars. And what I do at this point in time, even though I haven't used all of my meat up yet, is I start pressing that meat down, okay? You want to pack that raw meat in there very firmly. I mean, you don't have to destroy your vegetables underneath it. You don't want to necessarily, like, squish them to death. But you pack that meat in there very tightly. And then go ahead and add a few more pieces to each jar if you have it available until you reach about one and a half inch headspace, okay? You don't want to exceed that because, like I said again, your meat is going to render juice. And if you put too much in here, you're going to have overflow issues because 
you have your broth in here and your meat renders juice and that creates so much juice that it overflows and comes out of the lid during canning. So one and a half inch headspace total by putting this meat in here at the end. Add another one to that. Maybe even one more. Definitely more in this jar. And more in this one over here. You kind of learn how to feel your way and you kind of know after, uh, you know, after you've done this a few times, you know how full you want that jar to be. I think I can add one more there. And I have one more chunk, just one more little chunk out of this four pounds. And I think... I think I'm going to put it into this one right here. All right, so that was an amazing, um, I guess, ending point because, like I said, I had four pounds of meat that I had prepared, and I just, I was able to just equally distribute that meat through the jars. I filled the jars just perfectly with vegetables um, so that the meat just completed the pack just beautifully. I do have, out of my four or five potatoes, I do have some potatoes left. Now, what I can do is I can go ahead and I can either prepare those potatoes for supper, or if you were canning something else, you could maybe um, <clears throat> can those potatoes in like a pint jar or whatever. You just come up with your own, uh, I guess, solutions if you have extra uh, product at the end of packing your jars. But mine turned out absolutely almost beautifully distributed. I don't have any onions left. I don't have any corn or any carrots left. I do have peas left, so I prepared a little bit too many of those. I do have potatoes left. I have, I, I prepared too many of those. But everything else was just pretty much spot on. So you just take those things that you saw me do and you adjust, um, in your own way and like I said you know if you want to substitute if you don't want peas in yours and you would rather have green beans you go ahead and do that but look at how beautiful this jar is packed all right we've got all of our beautiful little layers now this obviously is going to change color as it cans it's all going to get darker but this is absolute beautiful pack and I have approximately an inch and a half head space um, on the top of where I have packed my meat in these are just gorgeous jars. Okay, so after all of that is said and done, we are going to go ahead and we're going to take a clean laundered washcloth and I just wet it with water. That's how I've done it for years. I know some people suggest to use vinegar, vinegar soaked rags, and uh, I can't tell you I have done that before because I've seen people doing it and people encouraging others to do it. I can't really tell you whether that makes a difference or not. They say that it does take the grease off the rim of the jar, and maybe it does. Um, but I have uh, canned for years just by using just a wet rag to clean the rims of my jars, and I have never had issues. So that's what I'm doing today is just a clean wet rag and wipe the rim of those jars really well so that there is no, you know, I don't know, grease or maybe salt or pepper got on there when I was filling the jar. You just don't want anything interfering with that seal. So make sure those rims are nice and clean. And then I'm going to place 
and my can my clean canning lids and I am using four jars lids um, I no longer use ball I have no faith and trust in them they have been uh, failing me as of late I was a uh, an absolute straight ball and cur uh, uh, user for <clears throat> decades and decades and it just seems in the last couple of years their quality has gone down and I found these four jar canning lids and I have had no failure at all um, particularly in uh, shelf storage you know a lot of times you can get a canning lid to seal uh, right after canning but the true test of a canning lid is whether it stays sealed on the shelf and I am super impressed with these four jars uh, they are not for sale at uh, Walmart stores but we went on walmart.com and found them and they are just they seem to be a better quality lid they have a better sealing compound than what the ball lids are offering right now and it has like a better uh, sealant coating on the underside of the lid so I'm really impressed with these just um, just a little tidbit for you I've been really really happy with them and I've been using them now for over six months and I have had absolutely no failures with them so uh, that's what I feel about that all right now we are just going to take and we are going to put our bands onto our canning jars and for some reason I am short one band well obviously I don't know how to count so I will have to find a, a band or a ring for that one in a couple of minutes screw them on finger tight okay and I want you to take and put a whole lot of wrist or or palm of your hand into it just take your fingers and screw it on fingertip tight and don't overthink it okay they're snug but they're not cranked on totally totally tight all right I'm going to run and get another canning ring for this jar and I'm also going to set up my canner and I'll be back in just one moment all right guys so I got that last ring on and I got my canner ready now I'm using my uh, Presto 16 uh, today which holds seven quarts uh, the Presto 21 and Presto 23 also hold seven quarts um, instead of adding vinegar to my canning water I have opted to start using cream of tartar um, just simply because it's a little bit gentler on your canner it's gentler on your canning lids and your canning rings it's not as corrosive and uh, if our water softener is working correctly now we have a private well and we do have hard water we have a lot of calcium and a lot of uh, rust in it or iron in it and if our water softener is working correctly I can get by on literally one quarter of a teaspoon of cream of tartar per canner load okay so this is just added to the canning water instead of a little splash of vinegar but right now I know that we are kind of running low on salt I've seen the signs you know in my sinks and things like that and so today I'm going to add a half a teaspoon of cream of tartar and I just sprinkle that in there you don't even really have to mix it in okay because when your canner comes to a boil it's all going to get incorporated anyway so I've got my canning water my three quarts canning or my three quarts of water in the canner I've today I've got a half a teaspoon of cream of tartar in there and I'm just going to load these absolutely beautiful jars of beef stew and place my lid turn on my burner and I am going to now my I'm going to back up a little bit my canner my canner water my jars and all of the food that is inside the jars are all at room temperature all right you never want to have a hot canner and cold jars of food you never want to have a cold canner and hot jars of food you always want to match that 
that temperature between the two of them. So all of my items are at room temperature today and I heat my canner over medium heat. Yes, it does take a little bit longer to come to a vent, but I don't have as many issues. Let's get this camera up here. I don't have quite as many issues um, with siphoning and I definitely don't have uh, issues usually with thermal shock, okay? So the more gradual you can heat all of that together all at once, the better. You don't want to just slam it onto high heat and heat it quickly. Heat it slower. Um, canning is one of, those, one of those things that you just never want to be in a hurry with, okay? It all takes time and you have to have patience. So I'm just on medium heat. I'm going to bring my canner to a full vent. I will vent for 10 minutes and then I will place my weight, bring it up to my appropriate pressure, which my altitude calls for 10 pounds of pressure. So I will bring it to 10 pounds of pressure and I will pressure can these quarts of beef stew for 90 minutes. Now, for those of you that are hot water bathing, you would hot water bath, whether you do it in pints or whether you do it in quarts, you will hot water bath either of those size jars for three hours, okay? Um, for those of you with pressure canners, if you decide to make these in a pint size jar, you would cut, well, everybody would cut the ingredients in half, okay? Uh, you would want to add, and now somebody else is coming home, so I'm going to just pause the video and I'll be right back. All right, so the hubby is now home from work, and, and the alarm dog has settled down, and we've said our welcomes, and now we can get back to it. So I think where I was was that if anybody would like to do this in a pint-sized jar, that is absolutely doable. You would just cut all of the... Uh, measurements into each jar in half. So, you know, when I said a third cup of corn or a third cup of peas, you would cut that measurement in half for a pint jar. Um, for hot water bathing, pint or quart, it is hot water bath, bath for three hours. If you are pressure canning, pint sized jars of beef stew are 75 minutes, quarts are 90 minutes. So, I am heating up my canner my Presto canner, um, over medium heat, I'm going to bring it to a full vent. I will vent for 10 minutes, place my weight, bring it up to the appropriate pressure for my altitude, and I am going to pressure can these for 90 minutes. And we will be back in just a little while so that I can show you the results of this wonderful beef stew. All right, guys, so I am back. I have completed my 90-minute pressure canning uh, session. I turned off the heat. I allowed my pressure canner to cool off naturally. At the point that my pressure uh, valve lid lock dropped, my emergency blow-off valve dropped, and uh, my gauge, which I don't always trust, but my gauge came down to zero, then I knew that I could safely take off my weight. And I cracked open my pressure canner and I just put the lid off to the side just a little bit. You can see right there. All right, I don't just automatically open and remove the lid because the cold air of the room can rush into your canner and it can cause siphoning of your product out of your jar. So I just cracked open my lid after the pressure was down to zero and I let it sit for about another 15 minutes. So we're going to open this canner and see how beautiful everything is. Oh, it smells so good. And yes, you can smell your canned goods. Um, as, uh, as they boil inside the jar, they push air out from underneath the lids. And so you can actually smell that food cooking. But I can also see that even though I think that I'm getting low on salt in our water softener, 
I probably added just a little bit too much of cream of tartar today. And I will show you why that is. Because opening this canner, I can see that the part of my jar that is up out of the water looks like it's almost coated in flour. All right. And that is a sign of just a little bit too much cream of tartar in my water. But that is not an issue at all. That will wipe off with no effort whatsoever. So I'm just going to remove these jars from the canner. Oh, they look beautiful. I do not see any signs of overflow issues in my can in my remaining canning water. I'm going to put this one off to the side and then I'm going to tilt my camera down just a little bit more so you can see. All right, so let me grab, here, let me grab my washcloth. I'll warm it up just a little bit. You don't want to have any, uh, anything too cold, but I just want to wipe off one of these jars. Just see how easily that wipes off. This is the cream of tartar, which is the same as vinegar. It just keeps the hard water deposits off of your jars. And look at how easily this wipes off. Ho hopefully the camera is picking this up. You see all this white stuff here that looks like flour? Look at how easily that wipes off. That is just simply the cream of tartar. Now these jars are still extremely hot. And you can see that they are still boiling. I'm going to just pick one up here. Oh, and we got a seal that just happened. I don't know if you heard that or not. But like I said, how things all kind of cook and kind of turn the same color. We had those vibrant, beautiful layers of color before going into the canner. And now everything is completely cooked. And the beef juice, the beef broth, it all kind of cooks, uh, I guess, some of the vibrant color out. But look at how beautiful this is. We have wonderful beef stew in a jar. All right, we'll set that one down. Let's look at... Let's look at this jar right here. I'm just moving these around very carefully and slowly because at this point in time you really don't want to upset any of your seals or your rings or anything like that. So I'm just treating it with the utmost respect and care at this point in time. But you can see, like I said, with the cream of tartar, and look at that, I can even wipe it off just with my finger. That is just simply a sign that I put just a little bit too much cream of tartar in. I thought that our uh, water softener, I had seen signs, you know, in my sink and my shower and the toilet and things like that, that we were getting a little bit low on water softener salt. But obviously I did not need a half a teaspoon. A quarter of a teaspoon would have done me, even though I thought that it was probably a little bit harder than uh, when my, uh, my water softener is functioning normally. But there, it just wipes right off. All right, so here's another one.
and you can see that's just still absolutely it's so hot it's boiling but look at those beautiful layers you can see the peas Let's see if I can turn it the carrots the potatoes the beef on top you guys these are just fantastic all right so I'm for tonight going to just stop messing around with them point my camera up just a little bit here I'm gonna leave them alone for at least overnight and all of my lids in that point in time should seal and tomorrow I think I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna pop one of these open for you so that you can see what the uh, the texture is of all of the vegetables and the meat and what the juice looks like that's inside the jar and I will show you how to serve it either as a soup or how to thicken it as a stew so for now we're just gonna let these cool leave them alone let them seal and we'll be back in a few hours and I will pop open a jar for you all right so it is the next day it's been over 14 hours since I removed my beef stew from the canner and I just want to share I have removed the rings now because all of my jars have sealed everything is looking beautiful I had a hundred percent success rate on the seals using those four jars um, lids but anyway I just want to show you how absolutely beautiful this is you can see the layers you know the corn and the peas and the carrots and the potatoes and of course beef on top so I told you that I was going to open this up so that you could see what the texture of the meat and the vegetables are so I'm gonna page down so that you can see this as I open them up there we go and here we are with one of the cans or jars of beef stew that I just canned for you on video I'm just gonna find a little ledge here now you know what before I open it up I just want I want you to see that the broth in here is still very liquidy all right so if you would like to serve this as a soup all you would do is open up a jar dump it into a pan and heat it and it's a wonderful perfect soup now if you want it to be more of like a stew what we what we would want to do is we want to take this broth that is cooked in the jar and we want to thicken that just a little bit and I'll show you one of my absolute favorite things to do so what I do is I open the jar and I drain the broth from the jar I'm going to actually make two quarts tonight because I know that my guys really love this stuff and they have pretty big appetites they work really hard and they're hungry guys so I'm gonna do two quarts tonight let me find a good ledge drain that broth all that good broth and vegetable juice and meat juice alright so you can see that I have very close to two cups of broth alright what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna top that off with just a little bit of water to make sure that we're at two cups measurement alright now if you were doing only one one quart you would need one cup of broth total I'm doing two quarts so I'm going to use two cups of water but what I do 
is I use one of these cheap little brown gravy packets. I think that I get this around 30 cents a packet at my Aldi's store, okay? I use one of these per one cup of broth from my canned beef stew, okay? Instead of using water, like what the package instructions direct you to do, I use that broth from the jar, okay? So, because I'm doing two quarts and two cups of water, I'm going to use two packets of this brown gravy. And all I do is go ahead and add that to a pan. Add my two cups of broth with water topped off to make sure that I have that two cup measurement and I add that to that brown gravy mix. And then I whisk that up I will start heating this according to the package directions. So what they instruct you to do on, sorry technical difficulties here, <clears throat> what they instruct you to do on these little packets of gravy is cold water, one cup of cold water per packet of gravy, and then you bring it to a boil and you boil it for one minute. I simply use the broth from my canned goods as a replacement of the water that they call for. Um, now another thing that I will do is if I do not have one of these gravy packets, I will make a little slurry of cornstarch and water and I will just simply heat up the broth from my jar. Okay, I've drained that out, I've kept all of the solids in the jar, but I've drained the broth out. I will make a little slurry of cornstarch and water and I will bring the broth to a boil and then add that cornstarch slurry to thicken into a gravy. All right, so you can do it either way. Another thing that you can do is you can drain off, when you open your jar, you can drain off that beautiful broth and you can place it in a pan and you can also thicken it with um, dry potato flakes, like instant potato flakes. You know how you buy those instant potato flakes in a, in a box? You can thicken all of that wonderful broth with instant potato flakes to make it thicker and kind of like a gravy if you want it more of like a stew. Now if you were doing just a soup, if you were presenting it as a soup, you would just dump all of the contents from your jar, your meat, potatoes, vegetables, and broth into your pan and heat it up and serve it like a soup. But if you want it more like a stew and you want it just a little bit thicker, these are a few of the things that I do to make it more of like a stew. So I'm going to start my heat. I'm going to thicken up this uh, gravy and then I will show you the finished results after that. I want to show you what the results are of this beef stew right out of the jar. I better turn this down just a little bit. All right, so this is straight from the jar beef stew, okay? Hang on guys, I'm still trying to make my gravy here, and oh, that's looking delicious. I'm going to turn that way down on low. Beautiful. Alright, so.
so this is the beef stew literally straight from the jar okay so you have your potatoes and look at look at this it didn't dissolve it's soft it's cooked but it's not dissolving on my fork all right the peas and the carrots here here's a carrot over here you see this I can completely pick it up with my fork same thing hopefully you can see this I'm going to separate a few of them same thing with those frozen peas you see these frozen peas here look at this I can pick it right up with my fork now the meat I'm going to separate a little bit of meat out look at these wonderful chunks look at these this is raw packed meat this is beautiful I can stick it with my fork completely on my fork but if I want to make sure that I'm on cam here if I want to look at how soft it can be I can smash it very easily I can cut it with my fork here's another chunk right here look at this fork tender fork tender beef guys this stuff is absolutely beautiful the corn let's see we haven't done the corn yet now this was previously frozen corn I'm gonna try to clean off my fork here this is previously frozen corn look at here golly I can't even hardly stick it with my fork it's still so fresh look at there nothing turns to mush all right so when people are saying oh everything's gonna turn to mush no it doesn't turn to mush you can see the consistency you can see how firm they still are this is an absolutely beautiful beautiful result all right so now let's make sure that you're caged up enough and I left that in the pot and it's gonna be hot now that gravy that I've been working on and like I said you can do that with uh, just a simple um, slurry of cornstarch and water to thicken the broth that you had in your jar or like I did you can add a gravy packet to it I have a absolutely beautiful gravy here Sadie come on honey really all right what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to add all of my vegetables into my gravy and heat them up so there's my one quart of vegetables and remember I'm doing two quarts because I have big eaters here and my guys have had a hard day at work and they're hungry they want their meat potatoes and veggies so I'm just going to put that second quart of vegetables in there with all those wonderful herbs I'm gonna change my stirring from the whisk that I needed for the gravy and I'm simply going to heat this through now all of my canned goods whether they are hot water bath or whether they are pressure canned all of my low acid canned goods I always make sure that I boil them for 10 minutes okay that's just a personal choice that I make but you can see already I'm just gonna take this off the burner and make sure that you can see it in the camera look at how beautiful this is just thick and rich and wonderful beef stew 
All right, so I'm going to boil this for 10 minutes, and then we will come back, and I will present it to you on a plate so that you can see the end result. All right, so I have heated all of my stuff for at least 10 minutes boiling, and I just want to plate some up here for you just so that you can see exactly what the results of what I have done is, all right? Here we go. Let's see if I can tip this camera down and hopefully the lights will cooperate with me. Sometimes when I go from light to dark, it doesn't cooperate so well. But here we are. Absolutely beautiful beef stew with a rich, thick gravy. You guys, this is absolutely amazing. I'm going to set this down and get a fork. All right, so here we are. Even after heating in the gravy, I still have chunks of meat that I can pick up with my fork. I still have potatoes that I can pick up with my fork. This is just beautiful. Look at all of that rich, wonderful, savory beef stew. All right. So I'm going to tip up just a little bit here. Me and my camera, right? <laughs> All right, so here's the real test, right? Mm. Mm. Oh, so beefy, so good. The peas, I can still feel the texture of the peas when I bite. Let's see if I can find some corn here. There's some corn in that scoop. Mmm. Mm-hmm. Perfection. Honestly, perfection every single time. Mm. This is so good on cold winter days. When you are looking for comfort food, when you are looking for something to warm you up, when you are looking for something that will fill you up after a hard day's work. Um, raw pack, beef stew, venison stew, pork stew, however you want to make it. This is absolutely a thing of beauty and comfort and goodness. So, there's the results, you guys. I hope that you found the uh, video informational. I hope that you try it in your homes and your kitchens so that you can have ready-to-grab meals off of your shelves. Just lickety-split, you have a hearty meal for your family. Um, so, until we meet again, God bless you all, and happy candy, everybody.